In this video, we're going to take a look at computer science AS level 9618 networks, including the uh, internet, talking about the connections, LAN hardware, and collisions. So there's a lot to get through here, so let's get started. So the learning targets, we want to show an understanding of the differences between and the implications of the use of wireless and wired uh, networks. So we're going to be covering all the different uh, types of cables as well as uh, wireless. We're going to describe the hardware that is used to support a local area network. That is a switch, a server, the network uh, interface card, wireless network interface card, wireless access points, cables, a bridge, and repeater, the role and function of a router in a network. So we often think that uh, routers get us online, but that's not the only thing they do. And then how collisions are detected and avoided using the CSMACD uh, protocol. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So wired networks, well, there are three main types of cables that are gonna be used in wired networks. That is the twisted pair cable, which is a copper cable, a coaxial cable, which is also a uh, copper cable, a fiber. Now the F-I-B-R-E, that is how Cambridge spells it. That is those optic cables. So they are not uh, copper, but they are fiber optic uh, cable. So let's talk about the twisted pair cable. The most common type of local area network cable is the twisted pair cable. Now, even though it's the most common, it has the lowest data transfer rate and suffers from external interference. And that is from the electromagnetic radiation. It is the cheapest option uh, with two types being used. The first one is unshielded and that's used by uh, residents. The other is shielded and that's used commercially. The cable contains a thin metal foil jacket which helps cut down on the external interference and you can uh, see that here. We also have coaxial cables. They're most commonly used in metropolitan area networks and it's also used by cable companies. More often uh, than not, uh, you this is what you have uh, in your home. Cost is higher than Twisted Pair, but it offers a better data transmission rate. They're also affected less by external interference. Now, it can carry about 80 times more data in transmission compared to the Twisted uh, Pair cable. This is why you get faster download speeds because it can carry about 80 times more data. Now, it does suffer more than any other cable from attenuation, but it does offer the best anti jam capabilities. Now when we say attenuation, it is the degrading of a signal over the length of a wire and that's why repeaters may need to be used. And the third type of cable are the fiber optic cables. They're most commonly used to send data over very long distances. They offer the best transfer rate, high resistance to external interference, and the smallest signal attenuation, talking about the smallest degrading of a signal. So it only sounds like there's positives here, correct? Well, it's unfortunately the most expensive. So here's how it works. Pulses of light are used in fiber optics rather than pulses of electricity. Now, if you thought 80 times uh, was a lot faster, fiber optic cables have about 26 thousand times the transmission capacity of twisted pair cables. So you can go with coaxial, which will give you 80 times faster rate, but you can go with fiber optics, it will give you 26,000 times uh, the transmission capacity of twisted uh, pair cables. Now, single mode fiber optic cables, they use a single light source and they have a smaller central core, which means less light reflection along the cable. This means data will travel faster and it will also go farther. It's a great choice for CATV and telecommunications. Now, there's also multi-core fiber optic cables. They use a multi-mode light source. This causes highlight reflections in the core so they're best used over shorter distances because when you start getting those light reflections that can interfere with the data so wireless network so we covered the three uh, cables let's talk about the wireless networks radio waves microwave satellites those are types of wireless connections for a network. Now, Wi-Fi uses 
radio waves. With wireless connections, you got to think about three things. The first one is the bandwidth. How much data can I transfer? The next one is what we call penetration. What is the ability for this to pass through different media? Now, when we're talking about different media, we mean solid walls. If you have uh, something in your house, is it going to be able to pass through the drywall? Is it going to be able to pass through the concrete walls? You have to think about all that. And then attenuation, which is the reduction of a signal. Now, infrared, for example, that has low attenuation but it can be stopped by walls and even rain. So infrared is best for indoor use only. If you're like, oh, what's an example of infrared? That's gonna be your cable uh, remote. So let's uh, talk about the comparisons here. So this is out of the Cambridge uh, textbook. You can see bandwidth, infrared has the highest bandwidth, followed by microwaves and then radio waves. So the symbol means better than. So infrared is better than microwave. Microwave is better than radio waves. So uh, the penetration, radio waves have the best penetration. Infrared, we said, has the worst. And then attenuation, that's the degrading of a signal. Radio waves have the best attenuation. Infrared has the worst. So that's a, a quick chart you can use uh, to compare those uh, when you're ready uh, to study for the upcoming uh, exam later this year. All right, satellites. So microwaves and radio waves are great for short distances, but the curvature of our Earth prevents sending data globally. And this is where satellites come in. You know, you got people running around saying the Earth is flat, and that's fine. They have the right to be wrong. Uh, you know, we'll let them be wrong, but the Earth does curve and it prevents sending that data globally. Now, communication is done between the antenna and satellite, which is carried out by radio waves or even by microwaves. Different frequency bands are used, which prevent signal interference. And this also allows networks across the earth to communicate by the use of satellites. So you have wired options and you have wireless options. Which one do you choose? Well, many factors need to be considered when making a choice. And one of the questions that may come up on your Cambridge exam, they may ask you, what are the benefits or drawbacks of wired and wireless? So here are the wireless network benefits. It's easier to expand networks and you don't need cables to connect devices. And this allows devices to be mobile. They can be moved around. Now there are some uh, obvious drawbacks. There's an increased chance of interference from external sources because you have all these uh, waves out there in the air. Data is also less secure. It's easier to inter intercept radio waves and microwaves than cables, so your data must be protected using uh, encryption. That's going to be a web key or WPA2 key, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Your data transmission is also going to be slower. Now, it's currently being improved and worked on, but you're not going to get as fast of a connection when you're directly connected. When you're directly connected, you're going to get the fastest transmission. When you're connected wirelessly, it's going to be a little slower. Now, signals can be stopped by thick walls. Signal strength can vary or do what is known as drop out, which means all of a sudden you lose your internet connection, which can lead to an uh, unstable connection. And that could interfere with uh, certain uh, wireless uh, devices or smart apps that you have installed in your home. So continuing on which to choose, there's some other things uh, to think about. And many factors uh, need to be considered. So wired networking benefits. Well, more reliable and stable networks since there's no interference because you're directly connected. And because you're directly connected, there's no dropout and you're gonna get faster data transfer rates. It's cheaper overall, even though you have to buy that cable and pay to have it installed. Now, I'm not talking about the cable that runs from your computer to the router, but you need a cable that you've probably buried in your uh, backyard or your side yard or running over uh, top. You have to have that uh, installed. You can't go out there and do it yourself, unfortunately. And there are some drawbacks. Devices aren't mobile, so they must be close enough to allow for the cable to be connected. You can't just take it anywhere you want. There's also gonna be a lot of wires that can lead to a tripping hazard, overheating of connections, which could be, uh, cause a fire and disconnection of cables during cleaning of the office. And uh, when those cables get disconnected, you're going to have a lot of people saying their internet doesn't work when really their cable just got disconnected. Now, there are some other things to think about. If mobile phones and tablets are being connected, 
it's going to need to offer Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Now, some countries have regulations on which wireless transmission frequencies can be used legally, and these vary uh, by country. To lay cable underground, you may need permission from landowners and authorities. The companies just can't go out there and start digging up uh, your ground uh, to lay these lines. They have to have your uh, permission. Now, there are signals all around us in the air. All these signals compete, and you need to consider this when deciding what you want to use, especially if you're in charge of a business. So there are benefits and drawbacks to each. You just have to decide what is best for you. Let's switch gears and talk about hardware for a local area network. You need to be familiar with the following things. You need to be familiar with, with a hub. I've started that for a reason, which we'll uh, talk about. A switch, which is like a hub, but slightly different. A repeater, a gateway, which you definitely, definitely, definitely want to know because they off, often ask about that. A bridge, a server. Now, we're going to talk about WAP, which stands for Wireless Access Points. You need that as well. This does not stand for Wireless Application Protocol. Do not confuse this for WPA, which is Wireless Protected Access. So they're very similar there. Do they do completely two different things. Uh, cables, we've already discussed this uh, earlier in the presentation. And then you have your network interface card, your wireless network interface card. All these things go together for a local area network. So let's dive into each one, starting with the hubs. Now, the hubs are un unintelligent. Uh, they're stupid. Uh, they are hardware devices that have a number of devices or computers connected to them. Now, it's used often in setting up a local area network like a star network. It takes data packets at one of its ports, but the reason it's unintelligent is because it sends it to every single computer on the network. Even if it's not intended for your computer on the network, the hub is gonna send it to every single computer, whether it should be for them or not. Now, this leads to terrible security and just wasted uh, bandwidth. Hubs can be wired, but they can also be wireless. The better alternative is a switch. Switches are what uh, computer scientists call in Intelligent. Like hubs, they connect to a number of devices or computers in a local area network like the star network, the star topology. Now, the switch when receiving the data packet checks the address of the computer or computers it needs to go to and sends it only to those it is intended to go to. Now, this is not a public IP address that is checked. We'll discuss why uh, later on in a different uh in a different video. Now, a MAC address, that's a media access control, that is unique address that each computer or device has. Switches receive the MAC address and know because of the MAC address which computers should receive the data and which ones should not. So the MAC again means media access control and all MAC addresses in the world are unique. Now, switches can be wired or they can be wireless. Moving on to repeaters. Now, repeaters are very easy to understand because they repeat. They boost the signal that is traveling over long distances. The longer the distance, the more attenuation or you know degrading of the signal uh, will happen. Now, they can be used on analog copper cables, and they can also be used on fiber optic cables. Wireless repeaters help boost Wi-Fi signals so there are no dead spots, and they simply plug in the wall sockets. If you have a large house and your router is all the way across the house, you may be getting a weak signal in your room. You can simply buy a wireless repeater, it goes into your socket, you just plug it in, and it will boost the Wi-Fi signal that is a repeater. Now, they're considered non-logical because they boost all signals that are detected. They're not selective of which signals uh, they will boost, so we call them non-logical. Okay, the gateway. That's a network point or node that acts as an entrance to another network and the exit point of the network. This is what gets you on to the internet. Now, if a network node needs to communicate outside its network, it has to use a gateway. It is exiting the network and going out and communicating with other networks. Any device that allows traffic to flow in and out of the network is a gateway. They can be wired. They can also be wireless. They connect your network 
to a different network using a different protocol and protocols are discussed in depth in the A-level curriculum and we, I do have a video on that so you can check that out if you're looking for all the different protocols. Now gateways can also be firewalls or uh, servers. So what you wanna know is that this allows your network at your house to communicate with outside networks. And to do that, you have to have a gateway. All right, let's talk about a bridge. So a bridge is a device that connects to one local area network to another one, and that it uses the same protocol. It's often used to connect together different parts of a local area network so they can function as one network. So here we have a uh, switch. So this is a different uh, type of area network. Over here, we have a repeater. Over here, we have a router. We have a firewall. How do we connect these two different uh, local area networks together? We do that with a bridge. So all it allows you to do is simply connect two different types of local, er two or more uh, local area networks uh, together so they can operate as one. A server, this is uh, one that is definitely popular on the Cambridge exam. They often ask you what is the role of a server and it provides services to clients. Now think back to the client server model we did in an earlier video. Servers do different things. Now some servers deal with email, some deal with website, some act as databases. There's even a server that turns what you type into your URL into an IP address that takes you to the correct website. For example, uh, www.google.com doesn't actually exist. It's just easier to remember google.com than google.com's IP address or Google's IP address. There are servers used for social media. There are servers that host gaming sessions. They provide a service to the client. Now, if you're dealing with this on your Cambridge exam, you may want to talk about how it uh, deals with email, websites, some act as databases. There's also the domain name system server or domain name server, uh, the DNS server that converts what you type in in your URL. Uh, it goes to the DNS and then what it does is it finds that IP address. So that's what servers do. They provide a service to the client. All right, let's keep going. Wireless access points. Now, they are connected into the wire network at specific locations. We have these all over uh, the campus here at the school that I work at. They are used where limited range is a problem, such as a college campus or airport, for example. Multiple wireless access points allow for uninterrupted wireless communications going from one end to the other. There's even one in our classroom, along with another one that doesn't work, that they just left up there. When they put the new one up, uh, they took the old one that didn't work, they just shoved it into the ceiling uh, that was several years ago and to this day it is uh it is still up there they use what is known as spread spectrum or infrared now sp spread spectrum is a wide band radio frequency that is of a range of a few meters to about a hundred meters infrared has the worst penetration but it has a range of about one to two meters this means it has very very uh limited you. So, uh, you know, spread spectrum is the best one uh, to go with there. Uh, so the network interface card, wireless network interface cards. So the network interface card and the wireless network interface cards allow you to connect to networks or the internet. So each one is gonna have a unique MAC address. Remember we said they're all globally unique, each device, and it's created at the time of manufacturing. They're used to connect you to the network and or the internet. Wireless network interface cards use an antenna to communicate with networks using microwaves. They can be plugged into a USB or they can even be internal. Now, most of the time today, these are gonna be internal, but if you look on Amazon, you may be able to find one that you can plug into a USB. Uh, if you have a wireless network interface card in your laptop, you don't need to buy one that connects uh, to USB. Now, wireless network interface cards work in two modes. Infrastructure mode, which requires wireless access points. All data is transferred to the wireless access point and then to the hub or the switch. All devices connected to the wireless access point must use the same security and authentication techniques. The next one is what we call the ad hoc mode. There's no need to have access to wireless access points. It's possible for devices to interface with each other directly. So those are the two types of modes that the uh, wireless uh, network interface cards are going uh, to have. So that's the difference between those. 
Now, a router, what does a router do? Now, a router is different from a hub and a switch because it allows you to access the internet. Hubs and switches can't read IP addresses, but routers can. It can join a local area network to a wide area network, and it can act as a default gateway, gateway allowing you to get onto the internet. It can perform protocol translation. Now, this means it can allow a wireless network in a wired network to communicate even though two different protocols are being used, uh, which is nice because you can uh, connect with anybody. It can move data between networks. It can calculate the best route for a network. Uh, destination address, that's also known as uh, packet switching, which is covered in uh, A-level. It can be both wired and it can be wireless. That is what routers do. Now, there's gonna be a router note I'm gonna uh, add here for future use. Every device connected to network has a MAC address. Devices using a router have a public and private IP address. When information is sent to you from outside the network, the router knows the information should be sent to you because of your private IP address. The router uses the table to see what the MAC address is of the private IP address and then uses your MAC address to send you the data. Remember, this is when we talk about public and private IP addresses in another uh, video. Uh, you can have a different um, private IP address every time you connect, and that is because when you unplug your router and plug it back in, it assigns every device a private IP address. And then that private IP address that it assigns to your device is tied to your MAC address, so it knows which device to send it, the uh, data that's coming through to you or to the assigned computer. All right, collisions. Now, Ethernet is a protocol used by many wired local area networks. Now, it is possible when using Ethernet that there could be an IP address conflict. This means two devices contain, contain the same IP address. Now, this makes it impossible to connect to the network because the router will not know which computer to send the data to or which MAC address to use. It's going to see two devices. You're going to get an IP conflict, and that's going to be very hard it's very, very hard to fix. It's actually very simple. You simply restart your router and your IP addresses will be reassigned. How do you restart your router? You unplug it, you plug it back in. Within uh, three to five minutes, you'll be back up and running because it will take some time uh, to connect. Now, Ethernet uh, supports broadcast transmission, which means data is sent from sender directly to the receiver. If two messages using the same data channel are sent at the same time, this is going to lead to a collision, and this is where the CSMA CD comes in. And the CSMA CD stands for the Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection. That is a mouthful, but it works on physics. When a frame, which is simply a piece of data with a MAC address, is sent, it causes a voltage change on the Ethernet cable. When a collision is detected, a node will stop transmitting and instead will transmit a jam signal which causes a change in the voltage of the line. And this is how collisions are detected. The jam signal tells the data, do not transmit. Each device using the cable is gonna resend uh, the frame due to a collision. Well, if they're both going to send it, how do they know when to send it? It will then wait for a random amount of time before trying to resend the frame. The CSMA CD protocol defines a random time period for the device, waits before trying again. The CSMA CD, because it is random, it's highly unlikely that both devices are going to send, resend the data at the same time. So here's a flow chart for how that works. They assemble the frame. What is a frame? Piece of data with a MAC address. We check to see, is the line idle? It sure is. So we're gonna to start to send the frame. We're gonna set the transmission counter to one. This is the first time we're trying. Is a collision detected? Nope. Then we're gonna to continue to send. We're gonna check that the frame was sent. Was it sent? It sure was. Is there another frame? Yep. So we're gonna put that frame together. Is the line idle? No, it's not. It's being used. So we're going to wait for a random amount of time by the CSMA CD. Then we simply go back to it. Is a collision detected? When a collision is detected, we stop the transmission. We send the jam, jam signal to let them know, you know, the line is currently being used. We increment the transmission counter. 
Have we reached the max transmission counter number? It's only going to try a certain amount of times. Once we reach it, we abort transmission and we jump back to A and we're going to let the user know, hey, it didn't send, but we're going to jump right back up here to the beginning. If we haven't uh, reached the max transmission counter, we're going to wait for an allocated time period and we're simply going to restart the transmission and check for a uh, collision detection again. So that is what happens in the CSMA CD protocol. Hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to help the channel grow. And we'll see you guys in the next video.